Well, good morning. God bless you. Good morning. God bless you. It is truly a privilege, a pleasure, my delight to be here to uh, worship with you on this day. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we're going to what? Rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. I just truly want to say thank you again for coming. Listen, I missed you guys last week. You know, we I was on vacation, so uh, my wife and I, we just uh, uh, celebrated our 16th anniversary, so we just got out of town. We put the ministry not really on the back burner, but, you know, we just was able to enjoy each other. Amen. So I just really just wanted to let you know today we're here. We just want to say thank you for coming to fellowship with us here at Man from Heaven Ministries. You know, I don't take it lightly that you could be doing something else with your time right now. So I'm not here to just entertain if that's what you were thinking, but I've come to give you a word from heaven. Amen. So as you're entering into the sanctuary, good morning. God bless you. We thank you for thinking not of yourself to come to fellowship with us. And when I say us, I'm talking about all of those who are tuning in right now through uh, via the internet, via Facebook, YouTube. We just thank God for you being present here today. Amen. And truly, there is a word from the Lord today. We're going to get to the word. So I just want to open us up with a word of prayer. We're just going to allow the spirit of the Lord to continue to just move in this atmosphere. I know that he's there where you are because he's an omnipresent God. And we just thank him for the Holy Spirit, which is moving in the sanctuary. We thank him for the Holy Spirit, which is moving where you are also. Amen. So as at this time, as you're entering in the sanctuary, we're just going to continue to thank God for bringing us through another week. We're just going to continue to praise him and bless his name and glorify him for who he is. For he alone is God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be able to come to sit at your feet and to worship you, Lord, to hear you, uh, uh, to allow you to just breathe on us, O oh Lord, to allow your, your voice to be spoken into our ears as we give you praise, as we give you honor as we glorify you for who you are. We declare and decree that there's no God greater than our God. You are a mighty God, a wonder-working God. You are a God who's given us life and you've given it to us an abundant life. Father, we thank you as we're sitting here today, as we're coming to fellowship, O oh Lord. You said in your word where two or more are gathered in your name, there you shall be in the midst of them. So we thank you for your divine presence. We thank you for your omnipresence. We thank you for your holy presence. We thank you, Lord, that you thought not of yourself, O oh Father, to come to sit amongst these, your children. Father, I don't know what they have a need of, but you do, Lord, and you said according to your word that every need shall be met according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So we lift your name up now, Father. We just thank you for what our eyes are about to see, what our ears are about to hear, knowing that you are God and you've already spoken this world into an existence. And we're just thanking you, Father, because you're continuing to lead and guide us through this course of life. So we thank you for it now, Father. As your word goes forward, Lord, we know that your word, as you sent your word, it healed them, it set the captives free, and most important, your word cannot come back to you void. It will accomplish the thing that you sent it to do. So we thank you now, Father, that as your word is preparing to go forward now, as this prayer is being heard in heaven and on the nations of the earth that you created, Father, we thank you right now that the chains are being broken that the shackles are coming off, that your children are being set free in the name of Jesus. We give you praise, Father. We glorify you and we lift your name on high because there is no God greater than our God. Father, continue to pour out your spirit upon us in these days like no other time before. Use me now, Lord, for your purpose and your glory. Let me not even speak as I studied, O oh Lord, but as you would give me utterance through the Holy Spirit. Father, that someone will know that they've heard from heaven today. And in all these things, I give you the praise, I give you the honor, and I glorify you. It is in Christ Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen again and again and again. Good morning. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just thank God because this is the day that he has made. Amen. So we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Be glad in it. Be glad in it. Amen. Amen. So again, I thank you for coming to fellowship with us here. I'm not going to delay it. I'm going to get right into this word because I know that there's something that God is going to speak to you because he's already spoken it to me. Amen. And I know that as he spoke to me, it's going to help someone who's going to be hearing it today. Amen. Amen. All right. So listen, our scripture reading is going to come from um, the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. Numbers 11, 1. I'm going to read it to you from the New American Standard Version. Amen. As you know, whatever version you read, if it's not 
not this same version. It's going to be what you have before you, but we're going to get the results that God intended. Amen? Amen. All right, so listen. Uh, where are we at? Uh, Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. And this is dealing with the people of uh, Israel when they were in the wilderness. And this chapter talks about the, the people complain. Amen? So here it is. The uh, Numbers 11, 1, and it says, Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the uh, out, some on the outskirts of the camp. Amen. As I said, this is Numbers chapter 11, 1. Numbers 11, the whole chapter 11 is talking about the people complain. The people complain. So the title of today's message is, I won't complain. Amen? The people complain, but the title of today's message is, I won't complain. I won't complain. Listen. Listen. As I said, we were on vacation last week, and uh, we had a wonderful time. I, uh, 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 where we went, though, you know, along the way from the time when I left, there was uh, reasons to complain. Uh, um, uh, uh, the the uh, We caught a bus, so I didn't have to worry about the Uber coming to pick me up, but then the buses wasn't running on time. The airline, when I got there, it was a misconception about where uh, the baggage. I don't want to mention the airline because some of you may work for them. <laughs> but yet and still, there, there was an issue about the baggage. Uh, there was an issue about my concerning my flight. My flight was rescheduled. I, I paid for the extra scheduling of the flight for my convenience, but yet and still there was some issues with that I could have complained about. I went to the restaurant to have breakfast. The line was long. Oh my goodness. The, the uh, hostess told me, she said that you're going to have to wait about maybe f uh, 45 minutes so you can get seated. I came into the restaurant. I don't want to tell you the name because some of you may work there or visit there, but listen. So I come into the restaurant. I go to sit down to my seat. It's been an hour, 15 minutes before beyond from what they had told me. So when I go to sit in the seat, then the waitress comes over and the waitress tells me, uh, I just want to let you know in advance that you're going to have to wait 45 minutes before we can get your order going. Listen, I felt I had a right to complain. I wanted to speak to the manager. So I asked for the manager to come over. The manager just took this sweet time before he came over to address me. Oh, he gave me some complimentary coffee. But nevertheless, I felt that I, I, I had a right to complain because first of all, if you would have told me it was going to be an hour for me to sit there, oh, I would have waited or it would have been up to me to decide if I want to wait or not. But I didn't. So you didn't tell me, so I waited. Then when I go to my seat, you, now you're going to tell me it's going to be another 45 minutes. And so this just, just escalated, escalated. I go to, uh, 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 we went out to dinner, and the next thing I know, we get to the place, and the uh, the uh, uh, cab driver who dropped us off at the uh, restaurant says, uh, yeah, when you come out the restaurant, you, all your the cabs are going to be right out front. You just go out, the, follow the hallways through, and you get to the lobby, and they're going to direct you where the cars go. So then when we get out, next thing you know, we have to walk, and we have to wait for the cabs. It's just so much that was going on. It was just like, you know, you have a reason to complain. And I wanted to complain and believe me and I did I complained now you may sit there and say well overseer That's you. I just don't complain about nothing. I just learned to accept things the way they are. Well great I'm not there yet. I'm on my way. So that's why today's message is called I won't complain. Listen We've all heard the song before. We even probably sang the song. You know the song says, I've had good days and I've had bad days. I've had many hills to climb. But through it all, God's been good to me. He's been so good to me that I, I won't complain. Now, you might have sang that song, but I want to let you know something. Even as I sang that song right now, I want to let you know something. We all heard that song before. We've all sang that song before. And guess what? We've all complained before. Amen. You are no different than anyone. Now, if you say you never did, I'm not going to say you didn't. I don't know. But I'm telling you for myself, I've heard the song. I sang the song. And yet I still complain. So the question is, well, why do you complain? Why do we complain? If you ever stop to wonder, stop to think, you know, I would believe that you would agree that our complaining changes nothing. It doesn't change the situation. It changes nothing. So why do we complain? Whether or not you realize that sometimes our complaining is not even going to change the situation. It's just the way things are. 
And no matter what it is, the amount that you complain, you're just going to complain. But sometimes we want to complain so that someone can hear us and may think that it's going to make a difference. It's not going to make a difference. It didn't make a difference. But yet and still, I have to vent. I have to get it out. So we're going to complain. Let me tell you something. We complain because it satisfies our sinful nature. Oh, yes, it does. Uh, believe me, you probably didn't want to hear it like that, but that's what it does. It satis complaining satisfies our sinful nature. Complaining releases what it does is it releases negative energy that we have. It releases that negative emotional energy in a way that uh, produces uh, uh, or, or provides a quick uh, uh, relief of frustrating of a frustrating situation or circumstance. When we complain, that's what we're doing. We're just venting. We're just letting it out. It's a quick relief of a frustrating situation or circumstance that we're in. I don't care who hears it, who doesn't hear it. I just got to get it off of me. I just got to let this negative emotional energy out of me and that's what complaining does it just releases that negative energy listen some people they tend to think that there's nothing wrong with complaining they say there's nothing wrong with it and it's totally hardest harmless we have every right to complain there's a lot of things that we sh that we should complain about that we don't complain about but we have a right to complain what do you mean that there's some things that we have a right to complain about let me tell you something when they talk about com uh, complaining complaining is contagious amen it becomes a uh, uh, venomous it's, it, it, it be because it's contagious complaining uh, uh, is an attitude of choice which means that you don't have to do it, but you choose to do it. And when you do it, it makes you feel good. It made me feel good, but it makes you feel good to complain because you got that off of you as far as you're concerned, right? Because listen, complaining is an attitude of choice. But guess what? If it's left unchecked, if it's left unchecked, it's going to change the way we experience our, our, our joy. It's going to change the way we experience uh, being genuine in our thankfulness. Because we complain. We're not going to be able to be thankful. How can you be thankful about something when you're complaining about it? Then this is what the word is telling us. Listen, the wrong attitudes, they're hard to change. Because when we allow this negative thing to get inside of us and we just complain, 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 that's the wrong attitude. And, and what I'm saying is that the wrong attitudes, they're hard to change because they become habitual. You know what habitual means. When they tell you a habitual offender, that means that you're constantly doing something habitual. You're doing it over and over. Whether or not it's this way or that way, you're doing it that way. You're doing it over and over. So complaining allows it, if it's, un, if it's left unchecked, it can become habitual. And by it becoming habitual, it leads leads to harmful ways of thinking about things in life. It, can, it leads to harmful ways of thinking about certain circumstances, though it still comes to be your choice, my choice of whether or not we choose to complain. Complaining is a choice of an individual. So it's up to you how you want to release it or you want to or, or, or just hold on to it. Now, I know people say, well, overseer, you got to let that stuff go, man. Don't hold on to it. Just, just let it out. How are you letting it out? You see, because the Bible tells us it's okay for us to be angry, but don't let your anger turn into a sin. Sin not. So if you're going to complain, how are you complaining? As you're complaining, what are you complaining about? Listen, when we complain, we are, we're expressing a dissatisfaction with a circumstance that is not wrong. When I'm saying it's not wrong, because the majority of the time, as I said, that's just the way it is. Listen. I know I told you, this is why my issue was with the hostess, because the hostess told me I was going to wait 45 minutes. I didn't have a problem waiting 45 minutes. But if you were going to be longer than that, then you should have told me. As I tell people all the time, you know, when we used to watch those reality shows, Jerry Springer, Maury Prophet, some of you probably still watch them. Listen, don't bring me on the show to tell me something. If you're going to tell me, tell me here. Let me make the choice of whether or not I want to go. So here it is. You you didn't, uh, uh, den you denied my choice of saying I want to stay at the restaurant. So when I talked to the manager, that's what he told Told me. He said, listen, if I would have told you when you were outside, would you have stayed? I said, no, I would not. He said, well, that's the reason why we didn't say anything, because we're going to lose money. But see, now you're cheating me out of my choice. So this is what happens when we complain. We are we're expressing a dissatisfaction with a circumstance that's not wrong. But the majority of the time, that's just the way things are. They know it's always going to be a long line outside this restaurant. They knew this, but yet and still, that's just the way things are, but we're not going to tell you about it. So, so therefore, I look at it as though you've given me a right to complain. We complain the majority of the times when we complain, as I said, that's just the way things are. We can't change anything about it. But we complain about circumstances. We complain about things or, or, or places that are positions 
conditions that we are not in a position ourselves to change. We complain about things that we're in no position at all to change. Now, at the same time of saying that, yes, I could have changed because now you've given me the opportunity to make a choice. My choice was to come to your restaurant. It was your choice to let me know up front that, hey, you're going to be here longer than you thought you were. All right, now it's my choice again to do something different. But because that didn't happen in that transactional way, guess what it does? It allows me an opportunity to do what? To complain. Amen? So listen, as I said, when we complain, we complain about circumstances and things that are, are we are sometimes not in any position to change whatsoever. And the majority of the times when we want to complain about something because that's just the way things are. But yet and still, we have no power or authority to change that. But we choose to complain about it either way. Either way, we choose to complain about it. Listen, we end up, if, if, I don't know about you, but sometimes we end up, when, when we're talking about complaining, we end up uh, 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 whining about things and proposing uh, uh, this situation, we go on with that situation, murmuring about this and murmuring about that. Everything is murmuring under our breath, uh, venting mentally uh, or, or verbally, which is going to lead to an outburst of a certain circum uh, uh, frustration. Listen, when you murmur or you uh, uh, just hold it under your breath, what you're doing is you, it's still there. It's still bubbling. It's still waiting to come out of you. You just got to find another way to get it out. All right. So, so the, what happens is when we end up whining without proposing the solution to a situation or a problem, we end up murmuring about it and we hold it under our breath and venting that uh, uh, venting, venting mentally uh, will, will, will change into becoming an outburst of frustration without any constructive attempt to rectify a situation. You'll just blow up because that's what you know how to do. We'll just blow up about a situation, whereas sometimes we need to talk about a situation, but we don't talk about it. We'll complain or we'll just hold it in. So we have to learn how to express the areas of our complaints. Amen. So listen, why? When you talk about, uh, I talk to some people who are married and they talk about with one spouse over another spouse. One spouse is complaining that the other spouse doesn't spend enough time with the children or the spouse doesn't spend, this spouse doesn't spend enough time with their spouse. When it comes to uh, social time together and hearing each other talk, they don't hear this. They, uh, so, so they're not working together. So if they're not working together to come together to correct the problem, then they end up complaining about it. We do it all the time. Listen, we whine and complain about social issues instead of praying. The Bible tells us that we are to pray about everything. And in all things, we're to continue to pray. But we don't pray. We continue to whine about the social issues that we're living in right now in our country, in your country as well. There are some things that you could be praying about, but you don't pray. But yet and still, you complain. You complain about it. We complain about the government, but yet and still, people don't vote. I know right, right now, I ask people, do you vote? And they'll tell me, no, I don't vote. Maybe your country is not one with free elections. But nevertheless, Yes. You, so you still have a right to vote. But you say, well, I'm not going to vote because if I vote, they're just going to give it to who they want it to get. Listen, we spend a lot of time complaining. And when you complain, people people always have complaining about, well, you know, people are starving all over the world. Well, are you doing anything to help? Do you send money to United Way? Do you send money to the Red Cross? Do you donate a can of food? I'm not just talking about a Thanksgiving or a time of the year, because some countries don't celebrate Thanksgiving, but a time of the year when you say, oh, it seems like a good time to go and give a can of food to the homeless shelter. No. So if you're not doing anything about it, you don't have a corrective solution about it, but you're going to sit back and complain. Yeah, they're all always out here begging, but you don't donate money. You don't donate food. You complain about things that's going on in your community, but you won't get in contact with the local leaders. You say the school board doesn't do the things because your child comes home and, and they're just changing the system the way the school system is, but you won't get on a school board. You won't voice your opinion in the right places where it needs to go, but you hold on to it, and then later on it's a, a violent outburst where it leads to you complaining. And that's just what happens. We begin to complain. And listen, let me let you know something about complainers. When you know somebody that's a complainer, you don't want to be around them. Believe me, if I was always a complainer, I wouldn't want to be around myself either. When you see somebody coming and you say, oh, here comes someone. So, you know, every time they come around, they're always complaining. You don't want to be around a person that's always complaining. Well, if you don't want to be around them, then what do you think God says about you and I? He doesn't like complaints. God does not like to hear complaining. You know why? Because complaining, it hurts those who are around us because it brings them down. Listen, 
I don't want, if I'm going to be down, I want to be down by myself. If I'm already feeling down, I want to get to you. Maybe you can help lift me up, bring me up to another level. But you don't want to be around somebody who's complaining and you're down already. And then all of a sudden they're going to come down and bring you more down. You don't want that. So when people are complainers, you, the last person you want to be around is a complainer when you're feeling down. You don't want to be around that person. And if you do, something's wrong with you. M misery loves company. Let me tell you something. Get myself away from that situation. I don't want to be around complainers. But the, and, and complaining, it hurts those who are around us because it's going to bring them down. And not only does complaining hurt those who are around us, but it hurts God also. Amen. Complaining hurts God. God hears our vocal dissatisfaction and, and, and God hates it. God hates complainers. You probably never heard that before. Somebody probably never told you. Well, let me let you know firsthand. God hates complainers. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like it. God hears our vocal uh, uh, dissatisfaction and, and God hates it. Why? Because it insults his grace. It insults the grace of God. It, it, it makes us question or makes God think that we question his sovereignty. You man, it makes God think that it makes it makes it uh, uh, God angry to hear his children who are complaining. What do we have to complain about? The Bible makes it clear to us that every word that we make, every sound that we make, excuse me, every sound that we make, even the, the uh, groanings of our heart, the groanings, God hears those things. He knows the words that are in our hearts before they come out of our mouth. God knows those things. So God knows when you're complaining. He knows it and he hates it because he doesn't want to hear you and I or any of his children complain. We have nothing to complain about because we're children of the Most High God. And God said what in his word? That he will meet your every need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So if your need is being met, what do you have to complain about? What do you have to complain about? Nothing. Some people say, well, you know, it's always hot. Then on a cold day, it's too cold. It's always raining. Then it never rains enough. People look for things to complain. And God says, I hate complainers. He hates it. He does not like complaining. The Bible makes it clear to us that God hears every word of and every complaint from, his, from the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness to this very day with you and I here today. God hears our complaining and he doesn't like it. Not one bit. Listen to the same scripture I read, uh, the opening scripture, Numbers. This is Numbers chapter 11, verse 1 from the uh, King James Version. And it reads, and the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when they and when the Lord heard his anger was kindled against them. Now, you have to remember in in the book of Numbers, the children of Israel were still in the wilderness. Right. And since they were in the wilderness, they were somewhere in the middle of the wilderness and they were complaining. They were always complaining. They were whining about this and grumbling about that. Always complaining about one thing or another. They, they, they were complaining that, that Moses style of leadership. They didn't like his style of leadership. But guess what? Oh, that was the sons of Korah. They were complaining about Moses' style of leadership. But God is the one who appointed Moses. They didn't see that. They complained. They didn't uh, uh, see that it was God's selection, but they complained about it. You may be in a church right now, and you're complaining about the reverend. You're complaining about the pastor or the overseer or the bishop. Whatever you call the, the uh, man or woman of God at the servant of the house of the Lord. Whatever it is, you're probably complaining. But guess what? God chose them to be the head of that house. And God chose them to lead, to give you the, uh, God chose to give them the wisdom to lead and guide the people. And if you have a, uh, uh, a dissatisfaction with God's choice, then maybe you need to leave and go somewhere else. Maybe you need to pray or stay and pray and ask God to deal with your heart, deal with you while you're there because God hates complainers. He doesn't want to hear you sitting there complaining about how the, the person or, or who God led God chose to be the shepherd of the house. He doesn't want to hear you or I complain about what dissatisfaction we have with them and the way that they're doing things the way. Like they got to check in with you before they write a message, before the sermon comes out. They got to check in with you on what they should teach for Bible study. The devil is a liar. They do what God appointed them to do. If you have a problem, then that's between you and God. And maybe God will tell you this ain't the place for you. Now, God's not going to tell you that the house of the Lord is not for you, but he's going to lead you to a place, not so much that you can get what you need to hear, but yet and still, he's going to lead you to a place to let you see that, listen, wherever, where it is that you go, I've already ordained and appointed someone to be in charge. And it's not you. It's not you. And this is what it was. They were always grumbling and complaining about what Moses was doing, what Moses was saying. That, listen, they didn't like his leadership, but he was picked by God. 
They complained about the not having food to eat, and God provided them with quail and manna. And guess what? When they got the quail and manna, they complained again. Oh, we don't have water. God gave them water. They didn't they like the water. The water might have been bitter, but God said, no, the water's not going to be bitter. It's going to be clear. It's going to be good enough, good enough for you to drink. They always had a problem to complain. Oh, it's too hot out here. It's too cold by the night, hot in the day. God heard all the complaints. And guess what? Everything that they complained against Moses, guess who supplied it? Who supplied the food? It wasn't Moses. Who supplied the water? It wasn't Moses. Who supplied the food, uh, 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 the weather? It wasn't Moses. It was God who provided. Who provided Moses to be the leader? God provided. God chose everything. So when they began to complain, they were complaining, but it wasn't against Moses. It was against God, and that's how God receives our complaint. Because I've been so good to you, God speaking. I've been so good to you. Who are you that you have a right to complain? For 40 years, they spent in the wilderness and their clothes and shoes didn't wear out. They, none of them died from hunger. None of them died from thirst. Yet and still they complained day after day after day after day. So much so that it cost Moses his opportunity to go into a promised land blessing. Listen, whatever it was, it was always something until one day God reached the final straw and God said, you know what? I sent enough. And God said, I heard enough. And he sent fire down among them. God made it very clear to the children of Israel of how he feels about complaining. And if he did it then, we just thank him for his grace because he's not doing it today. Not that way. Amen. Because there's some reasons, there's some reasons that we feel that we have a right to complain. Even as children of God, we feel that we have a right to complain. And God wants to let us know that I've been good to you also. I've done everything that you required. Everything that you have a need of has been already met. But yet you feel like you want to complain. Oh, have, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Listen, listen, listen. The Bible lets us know in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. It says, now these things happen to them as an example, uh, but were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages will come. What things? The things that happen in the wilderness. The Bible's letting us know in the New Testament, marrying it with the Old Testament, is letting us know that the thing, the, now these things happen to them as an example. To them meaning that those who were in the wilderness back in the book of Numbers, all the complaining that they did and how God sent the fire down when he had enough and he destroyed the camp, God wanted to let us know. The Bible lets us know that in the New Testament, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, for the instruction of us who are reading this word today so that you and Overseer Armstrong would know how God feels on whom the end of the ages had come. This is to let us know how God feels about complaining. God has never wavered, not one bit, to say, okay, it's all right to complain. Overseer, I understand you've been through a lot down there. You got it right now. Go ahead and complain. Let me have it. Because that's what's going to happen. That is just what's going to happen. When we complain, we're not complaining about other things. We're complaining to God. We're telling God that he's not good enough. We're telling God that no matter how he provided, it wasn't enough for us. No matter what it is, our complaints are always against God. And it lets God know that we're ungrateful to the things that he's done for us. We're ungrateful. We don't have a right to complain. The story of the Israelites was intended for an example of us here today living to let us see the dispensation of God's grace, the dispensation of God's mercy, because God's fire, he still consumes, but he hasn't sent it our way. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. We say thank you, Jesus. Listen, God hears our complaining and, and, and God sees our attitudes just as surely as he heard the complaints of the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. He heard theirs and he hears yours and mine here today. God, is, he hears us. And listen, Listen, because he hasn't sent our fi his fire down to consume us, then that doesn't mean that he doesn't hear us. He does hear us. But the reason that he wants to let us know something is that he's doing a work in us. The thing that we're complaining about is the thing that God is working in us. God is doing a work through you and I in the area where we feel we need to complain. Is the area that we need to thank him more. In the area that we need to give him praise. In the area that we need to just exalt his name and lift him up and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. And you're sitting here and you're saying, well, preacher, how can I tell God thank you for the things that I'm going through? How can I tell God that? Listen, I, need, I, I know you're going to tell me overseer that I don't have a right to complain, but you don't know the things that I've been going through. You're right. If that's you, you're right. I don't know. 
but God does. And you have to trust that if God knows what you're going through, he's the one, unless you're really disobedient and rebellious, then, then you're on your own path. But if you're saying that my life is directed by the Lord, don't you think that he already knows the path you're on? Don't you think that God already knows that you, that you want to complain and that you are complaining? So what are we supposed to do, overseer? Well, I'm glad you asked. Listen, the Bible makes it plain to us about what we're going to do instead of complaining. Amen? Instead of complaining, the book of James tells us, James, you remember him, the brother uh, uh, of our Lord Jesus? He tells us this in James chapter 1, verse 2. He says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. What in the world? <laughs> Overseer, are you sure that's what the scripture said? That, that, that the hell I'm going through, I'm supposed to consider it joy and that God knows these things? Yes, that's not what I'm saying, but that's what James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, that's what he's telling you and I to do. That whenever it is that we're going through times and we feel that we have a right to complain because of trials, because of the things that we're going through, the testing periods of our lives, James is telling us that we're to count it all joy. Count it all joy. He says, when you carry, uh, encounter various trials, why when I'm going through, do you want me to have joy, James? Why should I have joy? James, you just don't understand. And James answers your question in James chapter 1, verse, verse 3. James says this, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God is working something through you. He is working the testing that you're going through, that trial that you're going through. God is producing an endurance for you. An endurance Endurance means that you're able to go on. That you maybe you're not going to be able. You started off running the race, and now you may not be able to run. You might be able to skip. And after a while, you might not be able to skip, but you're able to walk. And even if you have to crawl, guess what? You're going to cross the finish line. And as you're going through the trials and the temptations and the testings of life, James tells you to count it all joy because this is what the Lord is doing. He's uh, in producing a greater faith through your endurance. Through your endurance. Listen, endurance means that you're going to have to endure. Endure the trial. Endure the testing. Endure it. You're going to have to endure it. Listen, God is telling us in his words, he says, uh, he's going to bring various trials before you. Various, meaning that there's going to be some things that's going to blow your mind. And you're going to say, I've never seen this happening. I never saw this coming this way. I never knew this was going to happen. You're right, you didn't. Because there are various things, which means that when, and, and this is another thing. He says what? Count it all joy because the, when, when you go through these various trials, Trials is a plural because it's S on it, meaning what? Oh, you got it. You're going to go through more than one trial in life. And God is, yes, I know, I know. Overseer, you just don't understand. I just feel like I just got out of a trial. And you're telling me now God is going to send me through another one? Absolutely. I'm telling you to touch and agree with the word of God. Now listen, if you're going through various trials by yourself, then you got every right to complain. But if you're going through and you know it's the Lord who's leading you, if it's the Lord who's going to bring you through, it, then he took you to it. He's going to bring you through it. You don't have a right to complain. You do not have a right to complain. Unless you're the one that wakes up in the morning and say, here I am, Lord. Send this test to me. This is the test I want. And then God gives you the test that you want. Or he didn't give you the test that you asked for. Then you may have a right to complain. But I don't wake up in the morning and ask the Lord to send me into a testing field. I don't wake up in the Lord in the morning and say, Lord, just bring these various trials my way. I'm ready for it. No, I don't ask for it. I don't. So, so, so therefore, if I don't ask for it, I have to Keep in the right mind now. Remember, my, my mind has been renewed. So I have to have the right mindset that says, if this is the trial and this is the test that God has prepared before me, he's placed me before it, then God, if he put me at the trial and the test before me, then it's the same God who's going to lead me through it, and I shall be victorious because of what God has already chose. He chose the test for me. Let me tell you something. God does not put a test before you that he expects you to fail. Amen? Because no matter how you go through this test, it is not an open book test. You have the book open in front of you at all times. You can read this word. You have a teacher, a great master teacher, who you can con consult with as you're going through your times of various trials and testing to help you to go in the right direction. You don't have to do this thing by yourself. Now, if you are, then you have a right to complain. 
That's the only way I can tell you that you have a right to complain. Because God is telling us that, listen, as these various, various trials, trials has an S on it, which means it's plural, which means that God is going to give us test after test after test. And guess what? He's expecting you to pass test after test after test because it's going to continue to perfect you. It's going to continue to uh, build you up so that your endurance levels are going to be greater than where it was. James makes it clear that the various trials are, 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 are testing of our faith are going to produce an endurance for us. It's going to do it. Listen, God doesn't want you to remain a baby Christian. I tell you this all the time. He wants you to grow up in this word. And the only way you can grow up in this word is by going through some trials and some testing. Trials and testing will increase your faith and your ability and knowing that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's why God allows us to go through these trials and testing. Now, if you're going through one on your own and that's what you chose for yourself, then you got a right to complain. Listen, God wants you to know that from the first, the first time you see a trial, God wants you to know that at the first sign of a trial, he doesn't want you to quit. God wants, he, 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 he is going to get more out of us every trial that we go through, every period of testing that we go through. God is building us up so that now we'll be able to find out that, guess what? That last trial, this trial is harder than the last one. And the next one's probably going to be harder than that. He's not going to continue to dumb it down for us and make it easier for us, no. But you're learning now that everything you've gone through made you stronger to go on to the next level. So even now when you're at that level and you feel that you've given it all you've got and you've gave all and then you've used up all the strength that God has given you, then that means that now you've completed it. And guess what? He'll give you a rest period. And then during that time of resting, he's also already preparing you because there's going to be another trial coming. There's going to be another trial. And guess what? After every trial, you should be able to stand firm. Stand firm in your faith, knowing that if God has brought you through one trial, then God can bring you through another trial. And guess what? Every time after trial after trial, your faith should be assured that I can do it again and again and again and again and again for as long as I'm walking this earthly life. No matter what trial, no matter what test that God puts before me, I know that I can conquer it because I'm more than a conqueror. I'm not doing it on my own, but I have the spirit of the living God inside of me and that's what makes me more than a conqueror that's how I'm able to go on so I can do it over and over and over and over and over it doesn't matter how many times God brings a trial and test before me I will not complain that's what our our, 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 our testimony should be I will not complain I will not complain and somebody sitting here right now like I said you probably sitting here and saying well preacher overseer you don't understand the things that I've been through already and you mean to tell me that just as soon as after I get out of that? You mean God is going to bring another trial before me? Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm telling you. And guess what? He's going to prepare you before that trial comes. And he's going to prepare you as you're going through the trial. Even if your trial takes you through a fiery furnace, you have to be firm in your faith and knowing that God is there with you. If the trial turns and leads you into a lion's den, then you have to be uh, firm in your faith and knowing that God is with you. You can't get there now and say, I'm going to complain because the lions are there. God knew the lions were going to be there. He's tested your faith to find out whether or not you'll go and continue to walk on with him. Walk on with him. He knew that they were going to need water in the wilderness. He knew they were going to need food in the wilderness. He knew they were going to need clothes. He knew they were going to need light. They were going to need the darkness. God knew everything that they had a need of, and he met their need. He met their need. And guess what? They complained. But not so with you and I. Because God is still meeting our need. And God doesn't want to hear us complain. God is going to put you through trial after trial after test after test because he's preparing you. He's preparing you. And he does not expect you and I to complain. Listen, I don't know what your trial is. I don't know where your trial is going to lead you to. But let me give you a hint about a trial, a certain trial. Amen. You know, in the book of Acts chapter 16, the Bible lets us know that when Paul and Silas were in Macedonia and, and, and they were going through the town, 
And as they were going through, there were uh, yeah. and uh, the magistrates. Be, uh, uh, she was she was uh, 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 she had a gift of prophecy, but she was using it in the wrong way. She was using it in in uh, a demonic way because she was using her gift to bring riches to the people, to the magistrates. So she was following Paul and Silas as they were going through town, and and she kept saying that these were the uh, men, these are the men of the Most High God. And and finally they got to a point where they heard enough of her, and then they just cast that spirit about of her, so that she wasn't worth uh, to God she was still worth something but for those that she was used to make money for when they found out that that gift they couldn't use that gift from her anymore they got mad so the Bible tells us that they came after um uh, Paul and Silas because they, uh, uh, they came after them I think this is around the uh, 14th uh, um, yeah the 14th verse and it tells us it says that after that they came after them and uh the, the people, the magistrates came after them. They said, uh, uh, the woman bringing her master's money. Uh, uh, they was bringing her much, much profit. And they were making money from, from her from fortune telling. And the people were angry because Paul and Silas was messing up the money. You know how it gets when somebody messing with your money, right? You will complain. <laughs> you will complain when somebody's messing with your money, right? So that's what happened here. They were messing with the money. So so the magistrates, they brought them into the court. And they said, these men are Jews. And, and they're coming and they're throwing our city into to confusion. Listen, the city was already in a confusion. They didn't have to throw it into confusion, but the people began complaining and saying they're throwing the city into a confusion because they're proclaiming uh, customs, strange customs. They're teaching things that are, are not lawful for us to accept or to observe because we're Romans and they're Jews and we don't do the same things that they do. We want we want to make money and they, they, they put the money, they, they cancel our, our way of making money. So the Bible lets us know that the crowd rose up together against Paul and Silas and the chief magistrates, they, they tore their clothes and they beat them. And then after they beat them, they commanded them to be beaten with rods and they threw them into the prison. Now mind them, they, they were already beaten them. They took their clothes off them. So now after they've been beaten with rods, I'm sure their bodies were bloody. And they threw them into the prison. They threw them into the deep part of the prison. Right? So now they're laying in the prison. And the Bible lets us know that one of the uh, um, the uh, uh, prisoners, excuse me, the commanding officer with the jailer, he was guarded securely with them. He was making sure that nobody was going to get out of the jail. And when the jailer got his order, he threw them into the inner part of the prison and he put their feet in stocks. He locked their feet in stocks. But the Bible lets us know that Paul and Silas, they complained all night long. You read that part, right? It says Paul and Silas complained all night long. No, you didn't, because I didn't read it either. But the Bible tells us that around midnight, Paul and Silas, now you might look at it and say, they had a right to complain, because they're saying, Lord, we did everything that, that Jesus commanded us to do. We went and we set that woman free, and we just came here to preach the name of Jesus. We just came to do what the Lord called us to do. Now we're in the prison. Now we are beaten. Now we're locked in here. Lord, I just had enough. I can't follow you no more. I've given up. I've. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible makes it plain to us that at midnight, the Bible Bible says at midnight, hallelujah, glory to God. When the jailer heard them, he said that they, uh, uh, they, they, that midnight Paul and Silas were singing hymns and praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And I want you to understand something. Listen, Paul and Silas, when they were beaten, you would look at it and say, hey, they didn't have a right to get beaten because the Romans beat you with 39 stripes, save one. The Jews would say you only get 39 and the Jews would only beat you to your back. But the Romans, they beat you all over. They beat your whole body upside down. They beat them. And here it is now at midnight, Paul and Silas are sitting in the prison. They're in stocks. They got chains on them. And the Bible tells us it was pitch dark. They were in the bowels of the prison. Their backs have been shredded from the beatings. Their skin probably laying off them they were probably uh, uh, in a lot of great pain and distress but the Bible said that they did not complain they did not complain but the Bible lets us know that they began to cry out to God the Bible says at midnight they began praying and singing uh, songs and hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them and not only were they singing praises to God of thanksgiving to God but they were also doing it loud enough that the other prisoners heard them don't you think the other prisoners would have wanted to hear them complain don't you think the other prisoners wanted to hear them curse God because of the things that they've gone through don't you think that that probably would have been a great a testimony for the rest of them around them to be able to say after all they've gone through and they're still praising God and that's exactly what happened. And this is why God lets us know, no matter what it is that we're going through in life, your life is a testimony. Somebody knows the things that you're going through even right now. Some you've talked about and some you haven't. 
but they know the things that you're going through. Some have been watching from a distance, waiting to see your downfall. They know you've been getting up on, on Sunday morning, going to the church, singing praise. They know that, but yet and still, they know, they're waiting to see now, what are you going to do? And you're still giving God praise. The Bible tells us that at midnight, Paul and Silas began to praise God loud enough that the shackles have came off and that the, the, the uh, uh, prison guard, they had to go out to the garden and tell them, hey, we're all here. Don't kill yourself. Because he was going to kill us, though. He didn't want to go back and face his boss because now he's going to have to explain how they got loose. He made, they made sure to let them know that, listen, from, for, if it's Christ whom we live, if for Christ we live, for Christ we, we die. They were going to serve God and they weren't going to complain. And so it is with you and I. We, God is, is going to put us through some trials and testing. Amen. But he is not expecting us to complain. No matter what it is, we don't have a right to complain. We have no right to complain about anything. Anything. Listen, the Bible tells us from the book of James, James 5.13, he says, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? Then he must sing praises. Listen, no matter what it is, sing praises to God. Be cheerful. Give God the glory. They were praying for their affliction. They were praying and singing. And they were also giving praise to God from their hearts that were filled with thanksgiving. In spite of the beatings that they have just taken. In spite of being thrown into a prison. They did not complain. But they gave God the praise. They gave him honor. And they began to glorify him. So much so that other people got, praise, got saved through their praise. Don't you know that if you silence your praise. If you let the devil silence your praise. Somebody's waiting on your praise. Because your praise. Listen. My praise may not be there today, but your praise can bring my shackles, break my chains because of your praise. And this is what God is letting us know. We don't have a right to complain. That's why the Bible tells us, listen, are we willing to do this? Are we willing to praise God or complain to God? You know, when you complain, it's the woe is me. Well, well, well or are we just going to thank God? Are we going to thank God when, when we feel that he deserves it because we say he deserves it? Or are we going to... Uh, uh, praise God because we know that he's always deserving of our praise. He is always deserving. Will, will we make a, sin a sincere uh, sacrifice to God based on the things that he's going to do? Or if he never does anything else for us again, will you continue to praise him and knowing that he's already done? He's already done. The same with your salvation. He's already saved you. He doesn't have to save you again. You're already saved. He's already saved. Listen. Listen. There's great benefits in serving God, but there's no benefit in complaining about God. There's nothing to complain about God. God is never undeserving of our praise. He is never undeserving of our thanks. We can never, on this side of heaven, not thank God enough. You can never not thank God enough for the things that he's done. You can never not thank him. God has been so good to you, no matter what it is. That's why, no matter what it is, we should always choose to say, I won't complain. There's nothing to complain about. I won't complain. I won't complain. And I know, as I said, some people are going to hear this message, and they're going to look at it and say, well, yeah, I, I, I probably won't complain. But then as soon as, as soon as you leave this atmosphere, something's going to come across, and it's going to cause you to complain. But we have to, like I said, not just sing the song, but make the song become a part of our lifestyle. You know, the song, the same song I opened up with. I've had good days, and I've had bad days. I've had many hills to climb. But through it all, God's been good to me. He been so good to me better than this whole wide world could ever be still I I won't complain for God has been good to me he been good to me better than this world could be still I 
I, I won't complain. Amen. Will you make that your testimony today that you will not complain? Amen. Amen. God has been good to me. And I don't know if you can say it for yourself, but I believe if you really look deep inside, you too would share that testimony that God has been good to you. He's been better to you than you've been to yourself. Amen. Amen. Now listen, if you don't know God as your Lord and Savior, you don't know Jesus then you have a right to complain because you're not complaining to God. You're not even complaining about God. You're just complaining about the situation. And that's probably one of those things that's just not going to change. But if you're willing to accept Jesus into your life and allow him to come in and to be your Lord and Savior, then there are going to be some things that will change. And things are going to, you know, your shoe size is not going to change. Your waistline is not going to change. But your salvation will change. Amen. All you have to do is just say, hey, listen, I believe. I believe it in my heart that Jesus is God's only begotten son and I can confess it out of my mouth. For the Bible says if you can believe it in your heart and confess it out of your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you shall be saved at that very moment. Hallelujah. We thank God for those who have confessed that uh, uh, confession of faith that Jesus is Lord and you've just been saved this moment. Hallelujah. We thank God. We thank God for you entering into the kingdom of heaven. And as I said, yes, there is a change that has taken place. There is a change that has taken place. Amen. And that change is begun as of this moment now. As of this moment. So listen, as you're a new convert, you just received something that you never had before. Reach out to us here at Manna from Heaven Ministries. If you're not a member of a Bible teaching, Bible preaching church, you get in contact with me. I want to be able to teach, uh, send you to a place where somewhere I'm sure that there's one place or another that I will know of a good Bible teaching church where you can grow in knowing of the Lord. Amen. Uh, if not, then I will keep you connected to myself until uh, we're able to find a place or home, a church home for you where you can grow into a body of believers and you can learn more about your Heavenly Father. Amen. And not only will you learn more about your Heavenly Father, but you're going to learn some things about yourself also. Amen. So when you find yourself going through the various trials of life, you'll see that you don't have to do those things on your own because God is with you. And if God be with you, then who can be against you? And if you whatever name you're thinking about, it doesn't mean nothing because God is with you. Amen. Listen, I want to pray for us before we leave here today. And I know some people have been going through some things right now. And I know some people have been dealing with uh, bereavement in their families. Some people have been dealing with sicknesses. Some people have been dealing with financial hardships. Some people have just been dealing with the, the uh, woes of life. And I want to let you know from the depth of my heart that I'm here for you. Amen. So whether or not you hear me verbally pray for you or say your name in my prayer, I'm praying for you now. Amen. And if you're on my prayer list, then you know I keep you lifted in prayer always, always. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time of fellowshipping together. We thank you for your divine presence, which is, not, which is in our midst even now. Father, continue to watch over your children, those families who are going through bereavement at this time, Lord. We thank you for sending a comforter into their lives for a time and a season such as now. Father, that they may be able to grab hold and say that it is well with my soul. Father, we know right now that you're able to do all things but fail because you're the one that tells us to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And right now, Lord, we're lifting up those who are going through a financial hardship, O oh Lord, that you will meet their need, O oh Lord, that you will be the one who opens the window of heaven and pour out a blessing upon them, a financial blessing, Lord, that they didn't have room enough to receive in the name of Jesus. Father, pour out the blessing that they will be a blessing with more than enough to help someone else along the way in the name of Jesus. Lord, I know you can do it because you said in your word that you can. And Jesus, you said that it's the Father's good pleasure to bless the children. Father, we thank you for it now for meeting the need in the name of Jesus. And for those who are having uh, illnesses and sickness in your body, the Bible lets us know that healing is the children's bread. And I pray that you will receive your share and more than enough 
of healing into your body now in the name of Jesus. Jesus said that the believers shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. And it is by faith now that I extend my hand to touch your body. And I speak not of my own word, but the word that God has placed in my vessel. He said uh, that James said, if there's any of you sick, have them call for the elders of the church. I take my rightful place as an elder in the Lord's church right now. And I pronounce a healing in your body in the name of Jesus. I touch and agree with your faith that healing will be manifested. That God will do what the doctors cannot do. That God will do what the medicine cannot do. That God will do what the nursing cannot do. That God will do what only he is able to do. And that is produce a healing in your body. He said in his word that he shall share his glory with no man. The doctor will not get the glory in the name of Jesus. The medicine will not get the glory in the name of Jesus. The healing is done through the manifestation of Jesus Christ and his presence that is in your life now in the name of Jesus. Will thou be healed in the name of Jesus? Father, I bless you and I praise you and I thank you now for I know that these words are not my words, but they're your words and you're going to watch over it and you're perfecting that which concerns these, your children. Let thy will be done in every area of their life for your purpose and your glory in Christ Jesus' name. I give you the praise, honor, and glory and it is well with my soul not even as I pray but let thy will be done in Jesus name amen amen and amen again you are blessed and highly favored you are the most uh, 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 blessed and highly favored of the most high God you're fearfully and wonderfully made and God has spoken a, a word over your life that said no weapon formed against you shall prosper no weapon of financial hardship no weapon of, of sickness and illness shall prosper over you in Jesus mighty name be thou healed set free and delivered today in Jesus name amen Amen and amen. Amen. Well, my brothers and my sisters, that's all we have for today. May God continue to bless you as you go through the rest of this week and the ending of this month. Listen, you can reach us right here on Facebook. You can reach us through Messenger. You can reach us through WhatsApp. You can reach us through our email address. You can reach us and we will reach back out to you. Amen. So as you're going through the rest of this week, don't forget to make time for God because God has truly made time for you. If you are being blessed by the words from Manna from Heaven Ministries and would like to give a donation or a contribution, please go to the link below. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.